Okay, it's 3.30, so we're gonna get started. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the CDTC New Visions uh, virtual learning series. Today, uh, we're gonna be talking about active transportation planning tools because it is bike month. Um, so we won't just focus on, on bikes, but we will focus on both walking, um, walking, bicycling, and um, the other modes that we've kind of included under what we're referring to as active transportation now at CDTC. And just as a reminder, um, our webinar guidelines, your mic is muted if you're an attendee and you can see us, we can't see you. Um, please feel free to send us messages or questions through the chat or the Q&A function, um, or raise your hand and we'd be happy to unmute you. Um, today's webinar, if you are representing a town or city and they have approved CDTC's webinars or other education opportunities, um, this can be counted as uh, credits for your state training requirements for planning and zoning boards. And um, as I mentioned, it's bike month. So um, CDTC has a number of uh, programs that have recently opened and initiatives that are about to launch. Um, we, we've taken this month to plan for next Wednesday's Bike to Work Challenge. Uh, we moved it to June to um, hopefully take advantage of better weather. Also walk and roll to school day coincides with our Bike to Work Day. Um, and we've created some tools for schools to uh, plan a walk and roll day um, and to talk about school uh, transportation safety planning. And of course, we recently released our Capital Coexist mini grant solicitation for this year. And we also have small amounts of funding available for bike skills training, both adults and youth. So um, the upcoming webinars as part of our series, we plan a webinar each month. In June, we will focus on transportation demand management. Um, in July, we will have both CDTC and CDRPC talk about what your regional pl planning agencies can do for you. Um, and in August, really kind of digging into the, the um, technical and traffic engineering kind of perspective of selecting and identifying locations for rectangular rapid flashing beacons. Um, and September, since it is uh, Drive Electric Week, we'll be revisiting our zero emission vehicle plan and how CDTC is supporting the state ZEV by 2050 um, goals. So how we are planning for electrification of transportation here in the capital region. And as always, our webinars are recorded um, and we upload them to our New Visions Learning Series Education webpage on our website. So um, today we have several presenters um, who I just want to thank ahead of time for taking, um, for, for making slides and taking your time today to to present with us. Um, we have Tina Carton from the city of Saratoga Springs, Carrie Ward from CDTC staff, and we have Dan Sirachi and Paul Winkeller from Urban Cycling Solutions. We also have Stephen Maples here from the CDTC staff to monitor the chat box and to um, help any attendees uh, if they have questions. Okay. So as a quick overview, the Capital District Transportation Committee is a metropolitan planning organization. We're based in New York Capital Region. Um, we're a policy making and planning organization that allocates federal transportation funding to local transportation infrastructure projects and planning programs. 
our planning area includes Albany, Rensselaer, Schenectady, and Saratoga County, minus the northeastern corner of Saratoga County. So that's South Columbus Falls and the town of Moreau. That's actually part of the Metropolitan Planning Organization just north of us, AGFTC. Um, there's about 78 municipalities in the region. They're all part of CDTC. And uh, we also include regional and state plan transportation planning agencies like the Thruway, CDTA, the Regional Planning Commission, Airport Port, and the Department of Transportation. And this is an out of place slide. Um, so as part of um, the implementation of New Visions, our long range plan, we've done this. We've done this virtual learning series, these webinars, um, but our other major products include Unified Planning Work Program and the TIP. Um, and we would be happy to meet with your planning board, zoning board, town board, or city council to talk about new visions or to kind of dig deeper into topics or themes or strategies that are covered in new visions. And like I said, um, New Visions the, and the UBWC and the TIP are um, our key products at CDTC. The Long Range Transportation Plan lays out our investment principles, which influence all of our other planning initiatives and what programs we fund in the Unified Planning Work Program, as well as um, how we prioritize capital projects to be programmed in the Transportation Improvement Program. So all of the, the principles and the strategies that are in our long range plan are reflected in how we evaluate and prioritize uh, capital projects. And just to uh, give you an idea of how um, this all comes into practice in pr previous uh, long range plans, um, we've identified both strategies uh, principles and also key projects that are important for the region. And because they're in the long range plan, they have been prioritized for funding over the years. It is how the region has been able to invest in and expand its transportation network, including the um, building and expansion of bus rapid transit, the construction of the Albany County Rail Trail, as well as the Zim Smith Trail and other major regional um, trail facilities, replacement of um, major bridges like the Rexford Bridge, and even the Madison Avenue Road Diet. Um, so what is New Visions? It's a metropolitan transportation plan, a long range transportation plan you often here, MPO staff kind of use those terms interchangeably, um, but we refer to this plan as New Visions 2050. It's a blueprint for the region's transportation system that reflects a shared vision for the future. Um, and it is de developed collaboratively, not just with the public, but with transportation providers and with our local cities, towns, villages, our counties, as well as our state agencies and of course, other stakeholders um, that are impacted by the transportation network. The centerpiece of our New Visions plan are these 15 planning and investment principles. They're directly related to the criteria that we use to evaluate projects and programs for funding. Um, and as you can see, multiple uh, principles are actually related to active transportation because active transportation, walking, bicycling, um, e-mobility like scooters and electric assist bicycles are all important in both reducing vehicle trips, to reduce congestion, to improve air quality, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and to create um, a more accessible and, and, more, and more mobile region. Um, so investing in complete streets, um, and in providing essential mobility for all, encouraging bicycle, pedestrian travel. Um, these are all principles in our New Visions 2050 plan. So in developing the plan, uh, CDTC evaluates trends in the region. Um, we, we monitor 
a number of different trends, such as how people are traveling, um, lifestyle needs, how, where people are working, how people are working, um, where people are building, and uh, how many of us there are. So in the capital region, we have been a pretty relatively slow growth region. Um, but despite that, we've continued to develop. Uh, and with this development without a major population growth, we've kind of become more spread out. We're driving a bit more. Um, and at the same time, our needs are changing. We have an aging population, and then we have a younger population that's delaying or completely forgoing getting driver's licenses. Um, we have an extensive infrastructure network, over 14,000 miles of, of lane miles, over a thousand bridges, um, and then plus uh, a sidewalk and trail network, as well as a growing um, network of bicycle facilities like bike lanes and uh, cycle tracks. And in the capital region, the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions um, is from transportation. So it is important to our region that we, um, we displace some of these trips, uh, move them away from vehicles uh, to cleaner modes. So what is active transportation? CDC recently expanded its bicycle and pedestrian planning program to include all means of transport that require human physical activity. Um, I know that there's some debate over some e-mobility vehicles and devices and how much physical activity they require, um, but CDTC does recognize that these uh, vehicles are important for expanding mobility for people who may be a little bit um, hesitant to ride a bike or who cannot ride a traditional bike. Um, and they also uh, expand the distances that we can, we can ride uh, or we're willing to ride um, without getting in, in a vehicle. So CDTC is referring to active transportation as bicycles, as walking, as um, mobility assistive devices, and then of course, as the electric assist, uh, um, emphasis on the assist part, electric assist vehicles like scooters and bicycles, and then some of the other um, e-mobility vehicles that we're starting to see more and more. <clears throat> and um, as I said earlier, the New Visions plan is developed with uh, in, is developed collaboratively with public support. And we know that there is public support to invest in active transportation um, and in other modes. The public has told us they would like to see federal transportation dollars spent on, on transit, on bike and pad, and of course on maintenance of our, of our system because everyone, um, the buses, <laughs> pedestrians, bicyclists, still use um, roads and our road network regardless of modes. So um, how does CDTC measure our progress in developing a connected and seamless network of active transportation facilities? Um, CDTC collects, compiles, monitors data over time to assess the performance of our transportation system. So we look at the number of crashes, the number of trips and how people are uh, getting from a point A to point B, the number of residents with access to active transportation facilities and services. So, you know, how many people um, live within a quarter mile, a half mile of safe, uh, well-maintained sidewalks or a trail or a bike lane or even a transit stop. Um, the number of miles of infrastructure built. And then some other things that are a little bit more difficult, but we try to um, consider is the economic activity related to active transportation. Um, and then of course, dollars committed to active transportation, whether it's in our planning program or the capital program, the TIP and health data. So how, how healthy is our region's population? Are people suffering from um, illnesses that are related to uh, inactivity?
So um, as far as planning um, resources and tools or um, work that CDTC has done related to safety, uh, CDTC in 2019 released its local road safety action plan. So it this uh, really covered all um, both vehicle, uh, bicycle, and pedestrian safety and crashes. And it looked at our local road um, system to see if there were trends, to see if there was a commonality uh, among crashes or how they were happening and try to identify what some of our um, biggest safety issues are. So the local road safety action plan um, outlines uh, what what are what our most vulnerable populations are and what some of these um, issues are. And it identified things like uh, distracted driving and um, just general bad driving behavior and speeding. Um, and then as for, far as vulnerable users, we, of course, bicyclists and pedestrians, um, and then motorcycles uh, are most vulnerable on our roadways. Um, New York State uh, developed and released a pedestrian safety action plan that looks at um, systemic actions that can be taken to uh, improve pedestrian safety. CDTC worked closely with DOT um, as this plan was developed and continues to work closely with communities to implement the recommendations in this plan. And also CDTC has access to state uh, crash data and um, on request is able to provide crash data and do crash mapping. In 2009, we launched Capital Coexist as a, trap, as a bicycle safety education campaign. And then over the years, it has evolved as a traffic safety education campaign. Um, and then through this program, we do general safety education and outreach, but we've also um, created some small funding programs within it, like our Traffic Safety Ambassador Program, which are mini grants for demonstration projects, for traffic safety law enforcement training and encouragement. We have some funds for bike skills training, and we've developed a walk and roll to toolkit for schools. <clears throat> and um, we continue to expand our data collection program, whether it's data that we're collecting in-house, or that we're um, identifying or um, collaborating with our partners to, to compile and monitor. CDTC conducts uh, trail counts on a regular basis. We also conduct bicycle and pedestrian counts on a regular basis and by request. Um, we have done user surveys for trails. We're currently um, working with a consultant to do traffic counts. And we're also, um, we maintain uh, a number of infrastructure inventories, including sidewalks and bicycle facilities. Of course, um, there is some data that CDC cannot collect on its own and we rely on others, the tra other traffic volumes, crash data, uh, trip information and health and demographics. So economic development and economic data, this is something that has been harder for us to um, kind of to pinpoint and connect with bicycle and pedestrian or active transportation projects. In the Capital District Trails Plan, we were able to do an economic impact analysis of the existing trail system and of a proposed regional trail system um, to estimate how much um, spending might impact local shops, but also um, how it affect property values and then uh, local tax rolls. Another point of data that we're looking at to monitor the impact, the economic impact of active transportation is healthcare spending in the region. And then of course, um, job creation. How many jobs are created from new transportation projects, especially active transportation projects? So if your community um, is looking to get started in active transportation planning, there are a number of strategies, regardless of um, the size of your community or where you're at, um, as far as uh, how much infrastructure you may currently have, 
um, how much funding you you may think you have available to 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 implement a program. Um, active transportation master plans are, of course, a good way to kind of inventory what you have, prioritize routes, and come up with a plan to um, to to implement your either sidewalks or bike lanes or trails. Um, safer to school or school safety plans is something that uh, there, we currently don't have a lot in the capital region, but we've seen in other areas of the country schools take on. Um, local trail network plans, of course, we have our regional plan, but we've seen local towns and cities develop their own network plans, kind of connecting to that regional network and creating um, a connected network of trails locally that may be tie into existing sidewalks or be an alternative to sidewalks, depending on um, the, the how your community, current, the size and current um, uh, character of your roadways. Of course, adopting complete streets policies, establishing a complete streets advisory committee that can work closely with your city or town hall, your traffic engineers, um, your planning departments to prioritize projects and build sidewalks, trails, bike lanes, improve intersections. And zoning, um, active transportation can be encouraged through zoning. Uh, Transit-oriented development strategies uh, can have a positive impact. Also looking at parking um, maximums rather than minimums um, or actually getting rid of parking requirements altogether to kind of create that more mixed and connected um, uh, character that is required or preferred to encourage walking, bicycling, and other non-vehicle modes. CDTC's new vision is 2050 includes a bicycle and pedestrian planning toolbox. Um, this is one of the 14 chapters in New Visions um, that really focuses on walking, bicycling, um, and other non-vehicle modes. It also includes a prioritization tool that helps CDTC identify routes um, and streets that should be prioritized for funding for bicycle or pedestrian improvements. There's also the Capital District Trails Plan. Um, we mentioned the Local Ro Road Safety Action Plan. CDC supports an active transportation advisory committee, um, the Capital Coexist Program, our Walk and Roll Toolkit. And CDTC uh, developed a bicycle visual preference survey that is tied to our bicycle level of service methodology. We've adopted the level of traffic stress um, and we, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, we update it based on, uh, based on responses to our visual preference survey. So we're always looking to see what local residents of the Capital District are comfortable with, where they would be comfortable riding, um, and applying that to a methodology for determining which streets are the least to most stress for, for riding a bike on. Um, other regional planning tools, CDTC's Transportation and Community Linkage Program. This is an annual funding program that supports communities to develop um, transportation plans like uh, a complete streets plan, but also bicycle and pedestrian master plans or bike plans. Um, and again, plans of almost any size for communities of any size that are at any point in, in the active transportation planning process. The CDTC and CDRBC Technical Assistance Program, which is currently open and information about it can be found on our website, um, is more of a small scale technical assistance program that works directly with communities to do mapping, um, data collection, or even some small scale feasibility studies like we're wrapping up working with um, Saratoga County, the town of Wilton and Saratoga Springs to look at um, a feasibility uh, of creating a trail connection between the Saratoga Greenbelt Trail and the town um, of Wilton. 
also ADA transition planning, which we'll hear about in a bit, and implementation of our trails plan, which we, uh, we're working with a number of communities right now to do trail feasibility studies. <clears throat> so um, going forward, our new visions plan recommends the following um, strategies and, and projects in active transportation. And we are currently either working, currently working or have completed almost all of these. So developing a robust bicycle and pedestrian data collection program, measuring the economic value of walking and bicycling infrastructure, planning to be ready for automated vehicles. So making sure that bicyclists and pedestrians um, will be safe regardless of the technologies that vehicles are, are using and adopting implementing the trails plan, exploring integrating of integrating health impact assessments into the metropolitan planning process, leveraging emerging technology to promote walking and bicycling as transportation, cultivating partnerships throughout the region, providing training and educational opportunities and tools um, to local planners and engineers. Um, So um, we, CDTC is always uh, looking for um, ideas or feedback from communities on what they need help with or what kind of assistance they need. So um, we'll continue to talk about some of the stuff that CDTC is working on. But for now, I am going to pass it to Tina Carton, who's going to talk about um, maintenance of active transportation systems and their importance. Um, this is something that we're increasingly hearing about from communities. They'd like some resources on maintenance planning or how to uh, plan for, for maintenance of their system. Um, so Tina, when you... Oh, can you not share? Yeah, I can't, I couldn't hmm. share. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh boy. Is it because it's a webinar? Um, give me one moment. I think I know. Okay. Sorry about that. That's fine. Jen, if you want me to go first, I can share. Um, I, I joined by logging in through our account, so I have ability to share. Okay. Um, okay. So why don't we go to Carrie and then we'll go to Tina while I work on um, resolving this. So sorry. Okay, so are you looking at my presentation now? Yes. All right, so I'm really going to talk about our transition plan process. Um, and towards the end of the presentation, I will get into the data collection process um, that we have been using. Uh, so this is just one slide, but I just wanted to set the stage um, to show some imagery about um, disability in the capital region. Um, so the graph on the left shows just the number of residents reporting a disability, um, the self-reported census data um, in each county. And then the map on the right um, is, you know, one dot equals 50 people um, reporting that they have a disability. So the point of this is just that there are people who report having a disability everywhere um, and that in locations where there's more people, um, there are more people who have a disability as well. So Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act applies to government services. Um, and it says that governments must ensure that individuals with disabilities are not excluded from programs, services, and activities. And pedestrian facilities are included in that. Um, they are an example of a program. 
Uh, so there's a number of basic requirements to Title II in addition to developing a transition plan, um, designating an ADA coordinator, developing a policy statement that says that you don't discriminate against people who have a disability, um, developing and posting either grievance or complaint procedures, completing a self-evaluation of your services, policies, and practices, and then uh, developing a transition plan, you know, assuming that your self-evaluation shows that not everything is fully accessible. And you need to say the name and position of the official responsible for implementing the transition plan. So um, transition plans are actually only required of government entities with greater than 50 employees, which is defined uh, essentially as a human body. So it doesn't matter, it's not full-time equivalent. Um, and it does include your police, which is a question we got a lot when we first started doing this work. Um, so if, you, if a municipality has under 50 employees, you still need to evaluate your programs, do the self-evaluation, um, but you just don't have to do a physical document that outlines how you're going to um, bring everything into compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So within the transition plan itself, uh, required elements are to have some kind of public involvement um, either develop or adopt design standards, and we strongly encourage you not to try and develop your own design standards, but to adopt pre-existing ones. Um, identify or list your the physical obstacles and the location of each of them. Describe in detail how you're going to make the facilities accessible. Provide a schedule for making the, the modifications and a reevaluation schedule, and then you know, assuming that you're not going to be able to do everything in one year, um, provide an annual schedule of improvements that you're going to make. So the standards that we're encouraging um, municipalities to use are technically uh, still guidelines. Um, the public right of way accessibility guidelines developed by the United States Access Board. They are applicable to both new construction and alterations of existing facilities. They've been in existence since 2011. Um, there was an announcement at the end of 2021 um, at the federal level saying that they are, they basically made an announcement saying that there was gonna be an announcement in April of 2022, um, which didn't happen. Um, last update I have is from March of 2022. And that was that they, the anticipated fully adopt, full adoption date for PROAG to make it actual standards um, is October of this year. But already um, and for a number of years now, NYSDOT has had it incorporated into the highway design. So one thing required in transition plans is to include a prioritization method of how you're gonna decide which facilities get improved over other facilities. Um, and that should include prioritization of um, places that are otherwise covered by the ADA. So that includes government centers, transit, public services, um, also things like um, grocery stores or um, places that are open to the public, does not include you know, other people's private residences. Um, we have discussed at CDTC and with an advisory group that we had for a number of years, also looking at pedestrian level of service. Um, can be a good idea to include in your prioritization that you're going to elevate locations where you receive citizen requests or complaints about inaccessible locations. Also population density um, and presence of disabled community and also um, considering cost as well. Um, so these are some best practices in terms of monitoring um, progress. Um, you know, most municipalities have some kind of um, work that they do on an annual basis. Um, so including the transition plan in, in their annual planning cycle of what work they're gonna undertake that year. Um, using it as a baseline and then tracking from there what improvements are made. And so in other words, considering it like 
like a living document and updating it. And then also, you know, as changes are made to the pedestrian environment, sometimes those have negative impacts on the accessibility. Um, sometimes street furniture or other things might get installed in a way that, that reduces accessibility. Um, and this is a slide on some survey work that we had done in the region, which basically told us that um, there wasn't much data out there on the location of sidewalks. So uh, we in our office undertook an effort to gather that information. And so we have it available and we've already transmitted it to each municipality in the region. It's basic information. Um, it includes the, the route number, if it's a road that has a route number, the name of the road, the side of the road that the sidewalk is on, the start and end points, um, the surface type, which is generally concrete or asphalt, but it could also be uh, slate or brick or um, other, like if grass is covering something, you can't see what's under there, and then the length of the segment. So here's a map. Uh, the gray lines are showing rows and the black thicker lines are showing where the sidewalks are. So basically what it's telling us is that um, sidewalks in the region are concentrated in places of um, population density, the cities and some of the villages. And then there are some linear segments, which if you zoom in are generally along pretty busy um, state highways. So we have been working on transition plans since 2020. Uh, we are anticipating releasing another solicitation towards the end of this year, which would put most of the work done on them since it's hard to collect data when there's snow on the ground um, in 2023. Uh, but we have been requiring in-kind match, not requiring cash match, although that's helpful. Um, and also requiring that the municipality arranged for the public input. Um, so we ask for a list of stakeholders that are anticipated to be included in that at the time of application to ensure that we're thinking about it from the get-go. And then a letter of support from the chief elected official. Um, so now I'm getting into a little bit here of, of you know, what we're doing in our pro process. And this, the image on the right here is the beginning of a uh, um, application-based um, data collection process. So when we're working with municipalities, we, we do start off confirming the non-data collection components. So do you have a grievance procedure? Do you know where it is? Um, and those other elements that are required in transition plans. Um, some kind of stakeholder meetings, which can take a lot of different formats, but it's important to invite groups um, that focus on people who have disabilities, including people who have disabilities, and also on seniors. Our work has shown us that seniors are um, fairly likely to have a disability, but don't identify as a person with a disability. But if you ask them if they have a hard time transporting themselves because of a disability, they will say yes. Um, we're, we've been providing technical training as part of our process for whoever is going to be collecting data. Um, we've been using our own interns, but if the municipality has municipal staff or interns that can um, participate, that's great, and we can provide the training for them. And then as part of the public um, review process, which is required, um, it's not required to do it as an agenda item on a pre-existing meeting, but that has seemed to work out well. So we... With our, what we have been doing um, is using uh, devices, basically tablets, although it would be possible on a smartphone, it's just a little bit kind of small, um, with internet service and a data plan and also with GPS. Um, and um, using somebody who's participating, having ArcGIS online credentials. So if you're familiar with the Esri products, um, we, it is possible to have a desktop license without having the online credentials still. Um, and you, what we've been using with the, the, these two apps here, the ArcGIS Field Maps and Survey123, you do need to have certain online credentials to be able to use it. Um, so the, the points that we've been collecting, this is part of the reason why we're using the, the tablet system with the data plans, 
Um, the sidewalks is pretty simple. We've been using the nice dot system that they developed for their transition plan. And a simple, essentially one to four rating on the, the, the condition of their existing sidewalks. Um, although we have been including a few more questions that's not accessible, like basic information on why not. Um, for curb ramps, information on the detectable warning uh, strip, the dimensions of it, and the contrast, light on dark, dark on light. Um, pedestrian signals, the type of signal that's there, and if there is one, um, and then whether it's visu visual, audible, or both, and then access dimensions. So if there's a push button, is it a height and a distance from the sidewalk that is accessible for people? Um, transit stops the access dimensions of the boarding and the lighting area and also obstructions to get to that area, um, to get between that area and getting on the bus. And then crosswalks, the, the surface, um, similar to a sidewalk, is it firm, stable, and slip resistant, and then does it not have um, cracking or heaving? Notably, it has nothing to do with the paint. It's a crosswalk there, whether or not there's paint. Um, so uh, the, the image here on the right is asking, is getting into the curb ramps, and this is asking about the detectable warning strip, which is DWS. Um, and so it's essentially, um, there's multiple questions on each type of an element, and it's responsive to previous answers. So if you say, no, there's no curb ramp, it's not going to ask you if there's a detectable warning strip on the curb ramp. Um, we are including pictures for inaccessible elements so that um, back in the office in two or three years, if somebody is getting back at that point and saying, okay, now this is the year that we're going to make improvements to that location, they can go back and look and see how severe um, the, the um, decay or whatever what the issue was with the element. Um, so our results are mappable. Um, it's easiest to look at them in a mapping application, um, but if you're familiar with um, attribute tables in GIS, you can pull it out as a, in a tabular format to include like in an appendix of a PDF so people who don't have access to the mapping application can still look at the data. Um, and then this is just an image um, of an in-progress, um, at an in-progress time when we were collecting data. Uh, and this is in Saratoga Springs. The colors are just have to do with whether the data was collected or not, um, not anything to do with the condition of it. Um, but it shows the, the density of information that is collected um, and the, the types, the lines are sidewalks and dots are the other things basically. Um, and then on the left here, if you can see it, um, it's showing the information that wasn't was collected for sidewalks. So there's the general accessibility rating, and then there's you know where they're missing panels, where they're heaving panels, obstructions, and was it too narrow? So it's just a little bit more information um, that is then queryable in the data table. Um, and then this is one my final image here, an image um, from a data collection effort that we didn't undertake. This is in the town of Bethlehem. Um, they had done theirs pretty early on before we started our work. And um, this image um, I think is interesting because it shows, it pulls up the, the image that they took of whatever the element was. And then it has um, the, the different kind of data points that they collected as part of that. So you can look at in a map format and then click on each one to see more information. So that's the end of mine. Thank you, Carrie. So now we can go to Tina. Tina, you should be able to share now. I think we did uh, resolve the issue. Stephen was able to find where I think they moved that, um, that option. Yeah. Okay, so can <clears throat> everyone see my slide? Yeah. Okay, if I go into the slide mode, it, um, I, I lose it on this computer. It's very odd. So I'm just keeping okay. it in this mode. Hopefully Got it's it. Under. So I'm Tina Carton. I'm with the city of Saratoga Springs. And I was going to talk about planning for maintenance and bike 
and pedestrian infrastructure in your municipality. I just wanted to remind everybody that um, since COVID uh, has hit, if anybody hasn't seen it, um, national trail use is at all time highs. So the findings of the Rails to Trails Conservancy showed that national trail use is up 79% pre-COVID. 78% of people now say that it's very important to have access to walk, bike, and that it's separated from vehicular traffic. 75% believe trails contribute significantly to the well-being of the community. 66% of people say they're getting outside more or about the same. 52% say they're exercising in their immediate neighborhoods and local trails. And now 46% say they consider trails and open spaces to be important. 46% also believe access to open space can reduce stress. So as Jen Saponis had previously stated, you know, there's a lot of health benefits to um, really implementing complete streets and bike and pedestrian infrastructure. So open space and this type of connectivity, either sidewalks, trails, bike lanes, cycle tracks, they're all extremely important for health of your community. I wanted to start off talking, like usually when we get excited about trails, when we get excited about bike lanes and sidewalks, we're excited about building out the infrastructure. But what happens once we've created the infrastructure? What happens once we kind of walk away from the grant source who may be funding building the infrastructure? Then we start getting into the difficult work of what's going to happen and how are we going to maintain these assets moving forward? So as we all know, sidewalks fail gradually over time. This slide is, um, the image in this slide is actually taken from work that we did with CDTC for our ADA transition plan. And they went around the city and they looked and they, you know, determined the accessibility of all of our sidewalk network. And that ADA transition plan work with CDTC is extremely important because it categorized all 98 miles of our sidewalk. And now we can really understand where we have accessibility issues throughout the city. We can target and start really um, budgeting for maintenance of those types of uh, that type of work moving forward. So as you can see, you know, sidewalks kind of fall into disrepair in a lot of different ways. Also, we're all, we all get excited about trails. I love them personally. But as you know, if we build them, they will come. But what happens after we're done building them? Um, some of these images, the ones on the left, are from our Bog Meadow Trail. I just took these about two weeks ago. Um, we have a major beaver infestation going on right now. The beavers are actually, um, they're located in this instance, there's a beaver dam literally adjacent to the trail. But our trail right of way here is very narrow. The beavers are cut, currently flooding the trail in a section of trail that's never been flooded before. And um, trapping the beavers in this instance is difficult because we have to now work with the private um, property owner adjacent to the trail because uh, a lot of their um, structures are outside of our right of way. Other trail maintenance activities, you know, you can see from the slide is, uh, of course, winter maintenance. And you need to know whether or not your trails are going to be maintained through the winter. Are you looking at a recreational trail? Or are you looking at a transportation oriented trail? Transportation oriented trails, if they, especially if they've been funded that way from the federal government, um, they need to be, or from the state, they need to be maintained and plowed so that people can access them year round. Other types of maintenance on trails are also all the different assets that are found on the trail. This is a very old trail sign on Railroad Run. I actually have a new one designed and ready to go. I just need um, for it to go out uh, to get a quote, to get it built, and then we need our DPW to say that they do have time this summer to install it. 
Other issues on trail are the pavement surfaces, um, whether it be graffiti, them, you know, falling into disrepair and needing to be repaved. Uh, Railroad Run Trail currently has a section that's being um, upheaved by um, trees and roots. And when we think about bike lanes um, in our city structure, bike lanes are the maintenance jurisdiction of our public safety department. So when we start planning and building bike lanes, we also have to understand what are all the different maintenance activities and who's going to be involved in those maintenance activities. The striping of the lanes increases the striping budget of the city, but also we need to maintain those facilities in the winter. And then as you can see, this was a slide I took when I was in Toronto. Um, some uh, municipalities have uh, really these kind of dedicated lanes off to themselves that are separated from the rest of traffic, which makes them safer for users. But it also makes it more difficult for the regular vehicles that the maintenance department may have to maintain these types of assets. So in this instance, Toronto has this little mini sweep, uh, street sweeper. They also use it for plowing. Um, but I just thought this was really innovative and just a great um, idea on how to keep these, um, these facilities clean and in good repair. So why is trail, sidewalk, bike lane management important? It's important for user safety. It's important that we preserve the infrastructure that we're installing. You know, we have trails that we're spending a lot of money to install. We want to make sure that they are um, in perpetuity and that people will be able to enjoy them and use them throughout time. Maintenance is very cost effective in the long run. If we learn how to maintain the assets, we're not going to be replacing them as often. There's also community expectation. They just need to be a comparable level of service to other public amenities. And I think that is a main talking point, both for your, um, you know, whoever is doing your striping into the streets, whoever is doing the maintenance and facility upgrades for all of these uh, trail, pedestrian, bicycle accommodations. They have to understand that when we're adding these assets, these are assets just like any other assets within the city, and they need to start budgeting for them and they need to add them into their inventories. Also, the management's important because it's generally a requirement of all federally funded projects and also potentially state and county funded projects. Some grant sources allow trails to be transportation related trails and other grant sources require them to be, you know, or don't require, but allow them to be just recreational. And as recreational trails, we have a trail in the city that's used in the winter for um, snowshoeing, for skiing. It's not used for um, transportation. It's used for recreation in the winter. Different maintenance considerations are What's the operational maintenance activities within that infrastructure that you're building out? What type of pavement markings are, are on that type of infrastructure? How are they going to be maintained? What are all the different assets? Are there um, bike racks? Are there benches? Are there um, wayfinding signs? What are all the different elements of that infrastructure that's keeping it together? You need to understand what's going to be a maintenance schedule to maintain these types of assets? And then how are we going to budget for these assets moving forward? There's a lot of great examples of guidance documents that you can find online. Jen Spohn has previously mentioned the Capital District Transportation Trails Plan. There's a section on maintenance within that trails plan, and I recommend everyone look to that and um, really read that section. There's a lot of great information in there. The Albany Hudson Electric Trail also put together a trail maintenance plan. That's another guide that your municipality could look at on how other local communities are dealing with this issue. The Empire State Trail has a list of inventory of existing trail sections. 
and it really lays out and gives a sense for the trail system of how much money is going to be needed to rehabilitate the existing sections that are in poor condition. So the Empire State Trail is a fantastic resource statewide. It runs from Buffalo to Albany, runs from Lake Champlain all the way down to New York City. But now that we have this amazing asset, how are we going to maintain it in so that users get you know, a consistent good user experience. There's other types of guides that you can find that have been made by other states, other municipalities outside of New York. Um, one of them that I got inspiration from was the Greenway Level of Care Guidelines. And another is looking at snow, uh, sidewalk snow clearing guides. Um, there's municipalities that have really interesting uh, programs on and um, guides for how they deal with uh, snow clearing on sidewalks. In Saratoga Springs, it's the responsibility of the property owner. So um, that's how we've kind of dealt with it. So Saratoga only needs to maintain the sidewalks in front of um, city property. And then all the other property owners are required to maintain them in, in other instances. But we right now do not have good guidance on our trail system. So that's something I'm developing right now is that we need to get um, trail uh, snow clearing, trail maintenance, trail responsibility language in our city code. So it's clear for private property owners um, as well as all of our other partners to give them an expectation of what's going to be done with these facilities. So understanding your municipal needs is really important. Um, I've created a trail asset inventory that I use internally. Um, in it, it outlays all of the different types of tasks that your maintenance crews may have to um, do for each of the different facilities. So there's weekly, there's bi-weekly tasks that you're looking at, um, and you need to understand what are the costs um, of doing this? So when you're trying to project it out, I have it here, um, you know, man hours per thousand feet or what the unit cost was so that when I know how many feet a specific um, facility is, I can project it out and, and give an estimate to my DPW, my public safety on how much that new infrastructure is going to cost moving forward so they can budget for it. And a lot of these guides that you'll find online kind of give you ideas, but really what you need to do is you need to go out and do your own inventory of those assets to get a sense of what is involved. There's also seasonal maintenance tasks. Here I have a photo of the Saratoga Library who they have a yearly volunteer day. And they worked with me on um, doing some seasonal maintenance tasks on Railroad Run. We picked up litter. We did some trimming of some um, bushes that were kind of coming into the trail section. And volunteers have really, you know, can be a really great source. That's also something that you're going to have to talk to your public works or your civil service about as well, because in some municipalities, um, civil service law, they, you know, the use of volunteers, it can't um, interfere with union work. So, you know, just be aware and make sure that you coordinate that type of work with all the appropriate um, departments. Budgeting for complete streets, budgeting for all of these um, different elements are extremely important. This is an image of our Bog Meadow Trail. And this is a bridge, and I'll get into it later in the slide. But this bridge was made 25 years ago by volunteers. It's worked wonderfully. People have enjoyed it. Um, but moving forward, we have a trail that is not accessible on the other side of this bridge. Um, we have a lot of beaver activity on the other end of this trail. And there's also a boardwalk in a section. When trees fall within this section of trail, there's no way for our city arborist to drive a truck to access that portion of the trail and then you know bring his equipment out. So he has to kind of hand carry everything 
And, you know, so as we look forward, we're not just going to be improving this bridge because um, the bridge is an aging out asset, but also because it needs other types of uses so that the trail can be better maintained um, over time. Understanding the routine maintenance cost. Um, this is a chart that I put together. And then I looked at all of these different guides that I found online. I tried to stick with cold climates and see how were other people, um, what were they projecting out? And so these are costs per mile um, and the approximate cost of staffing. This doesn't include like repaving or anything. This is just in staffing time. And I think it's really important to understand, you know, what staffing time is going to be um, involved in maintaining trails. So uh, this, uh, the ones that I've highlighted in dark are the regional examples. Um, the regional examples and the one from Pennsylvania as well as California tend to be in a higher cost range than some of these other um, examples um, from other municipalities. Some of them were older examples like the 2015 um, Rails to Trails Conservancy Guide. Um, so making sure that you understand what the time frame was that the, um, the guide was made. But I came up with a national average and a capital region average. I then used this information to share with our DPW department and they were able to budget for three trail maintenance staff in their department by utilizing all the information that I put together and making a case for why they needed more staff to make sure that they maintain these assets. Saratoga County has been building out the Zim Smith Trail and maintenance is another issue that they've been trying to tackle. So right now they have 11.5 miles of an asphalt trail and they had, they're expanding their crew right now, but up till now they've only had one full-time maintenance employee maintaining that trail. The trail usage went from approximately, um, Jen can correct me, but I believe it was like 40 or 79,000 to over like 350,000 um, since COVID. And from the expansion of the trail from Round Lake all the way into Mechanicville, creating really point-to-point -point access. So as we all know, as we build trails and they become um, ways to access new destinations and they really go between destinations, we get more usage. So they've really seen a huge expansion of the usage on their trail. And now they're trying to keep up with how are we going to maintain it. So these were figures that they shared with me back in 2019 of, you know, how they were dealing with paying for staffing and making sure that they start um, expensing out appropriate equipment for the maintenance of the facility as well. This chart was from the Capital Region Trails Plan, and this is the Albany Helderberg Hudson Rail Trail, and this is common maintenance cost for that facility. And this was done a, a little bit differently in terms of instead of per, you know, per mile, um, you know, this is like an overall cost, uh, but they looked at it and it was, um, you know, they put all of this together. So they kind of understood what their, their total cost was per year. And then they have the cost per year with equipment and labor. So, the goal is really getting maintenance included in yearly budgeting. So this is again from the Albany County Department of Public Works. This is just a public document that I found. Um, I was trying to figure out, you know, where is it in the budget process for other communities? How are they starting to look at maintenance and look at these ongoing costs? And so I found this, um, this in their budget, uh, presentation, their yearly budget presentation back in 2019. So they showed the accomplishments of 2018 as they paved the last phase of the trail system. And then the goals and performance targets for 2019 were making sure they completed the design and construction of the replacement structure for the trail over New Scotland Road in the town of New Scotland. 
So you can see that um, Albany County is really planning well for what are they doing to, you know, increase their facilities, but also, you know, what are they going to have to do and what should they look at to also um, replace existing structures? Hey, Tina, I don't mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to say it's 435. So I just wanted to um, make sure that Dan had enough time to get through. His okay. Slide. Oh, yep. Yep. I'll, yep. I'll go quick. I only have um, like a couple more slides. Okay. So this is the uh, Saratoga Greenbelt Trail. So, you know, this is kind of a, a quick asset um, table of like what we currently have. Um, the operational budget, this is things that these are kind of above and beyond the regular maintenance tasks. So the Bog Meadow Trail, you know, I have spec'd out and completed engineering of a new bridge, but now we have this beaver problem. The Geyser Road Trail, we need to resurface the sidewalk on the bridge. Um, there's a guardrail section I'd like to add. And Railroad Run Trail, uh, we need to repave that portion of the trail and add the new wayfinding signage. This is another chart of, you know, understanding my assets. So when I created the trail asset summary, you know, it really goes through all of the existing, the in process, as well as the proposed trails. And it gives a summary of each one. And then for each individual asset, I also collected more data. Um, I have photographs and maps are also included in this, but these are just some of the snapshots of what we have. Um, so, you know, I laid out, and this is really great information for grants for, you know, if there's a lot of um, staff knowledge, I guess, that can get lost when employees leave or change. And this tries to collect all that data together so that we all have an understanding of what our um, assets are throughout the city, and we can update them as new ones come on board. And that is the end of my presentation. So thank you all very, very much. I saw um, Ethan had a question about, do you know why South Lake Tahoe was so much cheaper? And my answer is, I do not. For some places, I did call and talk to them, um, but I had not done that for the um, some of the out west. And uh, I, I kind of was calling around more in the capital region and other parts in um, the state of New York and in Burlington, um, Vermont as well. But thank you very much. And I am gonna get out of my presentation and stop sharing. Thanks, Tina. Did I stop sharing? Oh. Oh, I see Dan's, you're good. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, well, I'm gonna dive right in. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having us. I am really, well, Paul and I both are really excited to uh, share with you a brand spanking new resource available to communities in New York State. Uh, well, I should say it will be available very soon, um, but as many folks on this call will know, in a competitive funding landscape, uh, data is just absolutely critical when we're trying to invest in things like active transportation infrastructure, bike lanes, bike parking, etc. Um, and it's often hard to come by data specifically on cycling. Um, cue the New York Cycling Census. We, we have a lot of really cool data that's gonna be coming out soon, um, all the way down to the county level, um, but I will get into that in a second. Just before we do that, a little bit about who we are. Uh, Urban Cycling Solutions, we are a consultancy focused on active transportation and complete streets here in New York State. Uh, that we have done some work nationally. Uh, some of you may be familiar with our work uh, through the Department of Health. We offer free complete street workshops to any community in New York State every year. Uh, we actually have one slot left. Uh, so if there are any communities on the call that are interested in a, uh, a complete street workshop, we are uh, all ears and, and happy to come to your community. We're also working on a number of projects, uh, including an extension of the Empire State Trail on Long Island. Uh, we just recently have begun working on a strategic action plan for bikes, pedestrians, and micromobility for the MTA. So this is the kind of work that we love to do, and we're all over New York State. 
I'm going to dive right into the census. So one of the projects we're working on right now uh, is called the New York Cycling Census. Now, some of you might be familiar with this. Some of you might have filled out the survey already. Uh, but this is the largest statewide consumer survey of cycling ever conducted in the United States. Uh, as of today, we have more than 13,500 organic responses. Um, people all over New York State, representing every single county in New York State, uh, talking about cycling preferences, uh, providing details on where, how, and when they're biking. Um, we are continuing to collect responses to this survey through May 31st, which is a week, uh, I, I think it's a week from today. Um, but this is really exciting because it is an unprecedented data set. There's no other state that has ever come close to having this much data on bicycle consumer preferences. Um, and I think it's, you know, I think this is a raw indicator of the interest in active transportation infrastructure and more safer bike mobility. Paul, I don't know if you want to quickly share any thoughts about the data set and, you know, the representation we have. There, Paul. I think I'm unmuted now. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, no, I don't have a lot to add. I mean, those of you that know, um, you know, when I ran the State Bike Coalition, I would often decry the lack of sort of macro New York State data across all sorts of perspectives, value of tourism, uh, a real pet topic of, of my mentor and friend Ivan Vamos is the uh, value of uh, what, it, what it costs to take care of people when they're in bike and pedestrian crashes. Um, there was a little talk on this uh, presentation before about the, the, the health care value in terms of productivity and wellness. Um, so I'm going to let Dan run through this. Uh, this was a uh, this was a, a kind of a blast to put together because we had an extraordinary amount of interest. I didn't even have to beg people uh, or organizations mostly that we worked with, I've worked with in the last decade. Uh, everybody, um, uh, everybody was extremely cooperative. Uh, and um, it's also, once it's released, you'll see it's a really good representation of the state demographics as well. So I'm going, to let, I'm going to let Dan run through this. So what is the New York Cycling Census? It's an online survey, um, and, and Paul really is, is the driver here. Uh, it, it, it would not have gone viral without him. Um, but we ask a lot of questions in here, including why New Yorkers are, are biking, looking at cycling preferences, asking cyclists to identify themselves by sort of their level of comfort. We're looking at where New Yorkers are biking, uh, where we're looking at barriers to cycling. We're looking at how New Yorkers are integrating bike trips with transit and so much more. I mean, we're looking at types of trainings, e-bike utilization, bike tourism, as Paul mentioned, uh, crash instances where New Yorkers have uh, sort of had a crash experience. So there is just a wealth of data contained in the census. What we're going to do now, um, I should say we are still collecting responses and we have not done the analysis yet. So there's, there's a lot of work ahead of us to take this data offline and start sorting by different demographics, by gender, by region. Um, so what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to show you a couple of the questions we asked. Um, and I, the disclaimer I want to give you is that these are, this is raw data. Now, I did pick questions that I think are acceptable and, and meaningful in, in raw form across the entire state. But there are just a lot of questions that really need to be broken down by region, by demographic, by gender, et cetera. So starting here, why do you choose to ride a bike? Um, New Yorkers have, have spoken and fun exercise, and well, exercise and fitness followed by fun are the, the biggest reasons that, that New Yorkers are biking. Um, but I think what's really interesting here is this bottom piece here, and, I, and Tina alluded, this, alluded to this with some national data, um, but we did not predict how important mental health and wellness was uh, as, as a driver for cycling. 
So we're, I, I think that's a really important finding here at the statewide level. And, you know, there are other things that I, I think we all care about, but I, I was personally surprised um, at the, the gap between these big top three and the things that you typically think about, like reducing the environmental footprint, cost effectiveness, travel time, et cetera. So barriers to cycling, what is preventing people from, or for New Yorkers from biking for any particular reason? Uh, not unsurprisingly, lack of bike lanes is number one on the list. I think this is something anecdotally we have known for a very long time. Um, and this also is likely going to be consistent across counties in New York state. Um, but, you see these two things go hand in hand here. Fear of conflicts with cars uh, go hand in hand with lack of bike lanes. If we have more bike lanes, I think fear would be reduced. Um, bike parking, a, another drive, if we look at you know bike lanes and fear as sort of one kind of aggregate, uh, lack of bike parking is a huge issue. Um, it's not just about having safe routes, it's about ensuring that our bike is gonna be there when we leave it somewhere, uh, when we get to our destination, that's absolutely critical. Um, whether you may look at this and say, well, obviously, um, but when I see weather as a barrier here, I think that this tells us that we need to really focus on how we can create alternatives to, tr to biking. So a, a good example of this is integrating bicycles and micromobility with transit. So that for you in the morning, as you're getting ready to go to work, if people still do that uh, in a post-COVID era, uh, if you're able to say, hmm, the forecast is kind of shaky at the end of the day, I'd still like to bike. I can throw my bike on the bus or the train at the end of the day, and we won't have a problem. That makes it a lot easier to make that choice. So I, I think this helps guide our decision-making about where investments should go and where we need to prioritize our efforts in New York State communities. Uh, again, I, I think there's good data on this. Uh, this is you know, bike frequency during COVID, um, but in terms of New York State specifically, the data bears out when we ask respondents, uh, the vast majority of New Yorkers are biking as much or more than they were before COVID hit. So I think this is really important as we think about the story of active mobility over the last couple of years. Uh, it's true, people are biking more. People have discovered biking and walking as modes of transportation um, and not just recreational modes. The last piece, uh, this was about training and what sort of things would help people feel more comfortable biking. Um, this is probably one of those questions that I, I think isn't as applicable at the state level and requires deeper analysis. Um, bike maintenance training is, is by far uh, the most important request, I suppose, from New Yorkers. That said, um, you know, I, I know for a fact that down in, the city, in New York City, Bike New York uh, runs an incredible urban bike education program. Their most popular class is Learn to Ride um, by far, and there tends, it, it tends to have a, a lot of women in those classes. So we need to look deeper into this question. We need to know what different genders are thinking. We need to know what different demographics are thinking. And we need to look by region. Um, but I do think this is really helpful as you're starting to think about programming in your community and what's of value. So moving forward, uh, right now we are uh, in the process of figuring out what to do with all this data. Uh, we were honest truth, expecting uh, a couple hundred responses and aspirationally thinking about maybe 1,500. Here we are at 13,500 plus. Um, the, the goal here is to take the data offline after we close the census and do a deep dive analysis and produce a report, which hopefully will come out sometime in the late summer, early fall timeframe. Um, in the meantime, what you can do, I mean, the, the census is still open. I have a QR code up here. We have a link here. Um, please fill out the census if you haven't done so already. This is really uh, an exciting opportunity for you to help shape public policy and cycling in New York State. Um, and if for no other reason, there is an incentive. So if you 
fill out the survey, you'll be entered for a chance to win one of three Planet Bike gift cards, very generous, $150 uh, gift card. So please fill out the census in the next week if you haven't done so already. Um, you we will, will be helping to contribute to a, an even stronger data set in the capital region, um, which you can then take and use for whatever planning efforts uh, you need in the future. Regardless of whether it's a report, a dashboard, or what you see, um, we will also be making the raw data avail available eventually um, once we have a chance to clean it and uh, make it anonymous and such. So that's the census. If you have any questions, uh, this is my contact information, but thank you so much for, for giving us the opportunity to share. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Paul. Um, so we... Are all we don't have any more presentations um, for today, and just want to make sure. Oh yes, okay. Um, we did lose Tina, but we have the rest of our panelists. Um, if there are any questions um, or comments, please feel free to use the chat or the Q and A. Um, you know, we didn't. I didn't talk too much about funding um, resources, but with the bipartisan infrastructure law, there's a number of discretionary funds and discretionary grant programs that are being announced almost every week. Um, and many of them um, include funding for, for, for safety and for bike ped planning and for projects. So um, CDTC has made a kind of a call out back box right on the top of its webpage and has a page that is listing all the discretionary programs and guidance as they come out so that we can help folks um, if they're interested in, in applying for any of those programs. Um, this webinar has been recorded and it will be uploaded to the CDTC website. All of the programs and projects um, that I spoke about today are on our website and um, the New Visions Learning Series has its own web page, so you can go back and look at other presentations. Um, please feel free to reach out if you have questions or um, want some details on any of the programs or projects that were discussed today. So, um, Stephen, I don't see any other anything else in the chat or Q and A. Do you have anything? I think we're good. All right. Okay, so thank you to our panelists, um, Tina, Carrie, Dan, Paul, and Stephen. Thank you for your help today. I hope everyone has a great afternoon and um, uh, we'll see you next month. Bye everyone. <laughs>